All right. So uh, for this lecture, I want to talk almost exclusively about uh, this poem. Um, we call it just Tintern Abbey, um, but the official title is uh, Lines Composed a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey on Revisiting the Banks of the Y During a Tour, July 13th, 1798. Um, this poem, by the way, was, uh, I believe, the last poem um, in the volume called Lyrical Ballads, the volume of poetry that I was discussing in the last lecture. And this is the most different kind of poem uh, in that collection. Most of the poems in Lyrical Ballads are um, about sort of overlooked rural people. Their poems like The Ruined Cottage, uh, The Idiot Boy, We Are Seven, Anecdote for Fathers, sort of like little vignettes, little uh, slices of life from um, peasant life in England. But this is uh, the one poem that is... Uh, a meditation. It's the one poem that is, I think, uh, truly lyric in its intention. It has a depth of psychology and philosophy. It's about almost everything that is important to Wordsworth. This poem is the blueprint for understanding Wordsworth and understanding all his poetry um, from from then on. So this is a seminal poem. This poem is sort of um, ushered in British Romanticism and was a different kind of voice. Um, when you read this poem, it, it, it is just a, it's, it's just a meditation. It's a person reflecting on their life. Um, talking about memory, past, present, and future, um, the insecurities he has, the hopes he has, uh, the anxiety he has, uh, that, that incredible sense of loss. I mean, it's all in this poem, and this poem is an absolute work of genius. Um, and it's really the first poem that Wordsworth wrote that signaled that he would be a great poet and that this and that he Wordsworth would go and sort of alter poetry forever now it's this poem has a very um, special place in my heart uh, this was sort of the first poem that I really really read I mean, of course I've read poems in high school and stuff, but this was the first poem that I read that really illustrated the power of poetry, the power of language. Um, this is the poem, when I first read it as an undergraduate, I just, um, I was just in, in, in awe of, of this poem. I mean, I, I couldn't think about anything else. I mean, it's probably one of the reasons why, um, for better or for worse, I am in this position um, teaching literature at a university because I read this poem, and this was over 25 years ago. There was a time, really, when uh, I, I could recite this entire poem by heart. Um, I can't do that anymore, but... Uh, I, when I read, every time I read this poem, I've been reading it for 25 years, I always get something new, something different, something more, um, uh, some new kind of insight, some new kind of thing that I can identify with. It's perhaps, um, you know, only somebody of a certain age and maturity can, uh, can really grasp these things. So, okay, so I'm going to go through this poem fairly carefully. Um, it's a long poem, and um, I, I 
don't want to leave out anything, yet I don't want to just sort of um, uh, focus on a line or two for uh, for too long. I I do want to go get through this, but um, I will make a lot of uh, stops and starts. So let's begin. Um, this is just a place. Um, this this poem, the the title of this poem is just a, a place and a time, time and place, right? A moment, really. It's it's a moment of composition, right? And this moment occurred while he was on the banks uh, of the Y River in 1798. So five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters. And again, I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. So he repeats the word five years, five summers with the length of five long winters. You know, that repetition emphasizes the length of time that he's been away, right? And again, I hear, right? So it's very important that this is not a new place to him, but this is a place that he remembers. This is a place where um, he is absolutely f familiar with, you know, like places like that when you, uh, you haven't been there in a long time, but once you're in there, you kind of, everything comes back to you. That's sort of what's happening here. And all his senses are opened up, right? I hear the, these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. He can hear um, the water um, flowing off into creeks or streams off the mountain, right? And it sounds like a murmur, right? There's something that is deep in the woods that you can hear it. Like when people talk about a heart murmur, um, it's, and you know, this really is sort of like describing uh, the environment as sort of a person, as sort of a body. Right? Um, once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of a more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. So he's looking around again and he beholds these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of a more deep seclusion. Um, He's secluded, he's isolated, he's all along, he's surrounded by these huge cliffs and that feeling of aloneness, that feeling of being the only one there, that, that intense solitariness that he feels being sort of um, sheltered, surrounded by these cliffs, they're sort of insulating him from the rest of the world um, and he's sort of losing himself in this scene right he calls it a wild he loves the word wild um, wild secluded scene impressed us with more deep seclusion so this is a, a secluded scene but his, it brings him to feel even deeper seclusion because because he's here so the exterior world is sort of um, um, influencing his interior life. He is secluded physically, and by virtue of that, he feels more secluded um, mentally or emotionally. The day has come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at the season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Okay, so again, he's, he's, he's continuing this description, right? He's under a dark sycamore tree. He sees uh, cottages in the distant, orchard tufts, you know, there's some uh, um, apple orchards. You know, this is a spring scene, so the apples haven't turned color. Right, so they're clad in one green hue, like uh, 
uh, green apples on a green tree, so it sort of just looks totally green. Yeah, and he's describing impressions. He's, he's describing how he, uh, what, what kind of impressions he gets as he's here, um, contemplating things. Um, once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild. Hedgerows are just um, uh, bushes, right? And they're hardly hedgerows, you know, they're, they're not even grown out yet. Little lines of sportive wood run wild. Again, he repeats the word wild again. Wild is a, it's, it's a word that Rousseau loved. It's a, it's a word that Wordsworth loves. Um, there's something that is wild within us that recognizes the wildness in nature. And it is important to give yourselves up to that, right? Remember I talked about romanticism is about spontaneity. It's about instinct. It's about intuition, kind of these things that are in a sense beyond thought, right? Wild means wild, means uncontrolled, right? It's the opposite of deliberate. It's the opposite of thought out. Um, these pastoral farms, green to the very door and reeds of smoke, sent up in silence from among the trees. So he sees this whole valley, um, cottages, uh, reeds of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. It's a lovely image. <clears throat> he sees these cottages and, you know, the, the smoke must be coming from one of the, the fireplaces or stoves in these cottages. And they're sent up in silence. And it's a very silent scene. And he can see um, traces of life in these puffs of smoke, wreaths of smoke, set up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the house, this woods. <clears throat> he says, you know, these might be, um, might be from cottages, or it could be a vagrant, right? Kind of a homeless person camping out and making a fire for himself in houseless woods. Or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. And he ends this with the aloneness, right? Hermits are people who, who separate the monks. They separate from the world. <clears throat> so he's speculating where this, where this smoke comes from. And in that speculation, he goes back to the idea of seclusion, the hermit. Is secluded, or the or the vagrant, or the vagrant dweller, which is like the homeless person, is in the woods. Next paragraph here. These beauteous forms, through a long absence, have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. <clears throat> That's a weird line, but he's reiterating that it's it's not like I am so excited about this scene, not because it's the first time I've seen it, right? It's not like a blind person finally gets to see something. It's that he's, he sees it again. And this is a very important. His present self uh, and his past self. He, the, he's sort of comparing these things, right? Um, it's a long absence. Have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. Right? It's not like I I've, um, haven't seen this before, and it just wows me. But what does this scene do? Right? What what is? I don't know how to explain it, but the scene itself, being here, remembering what it was like five years ago, and kind of feeling the the power of this seclusion, of this nature, he wants to analyze the significance of that in his life, right? Um, but oft in lonely rooms amid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the heart and felt along, felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind, with tranquil restorations. <clears throat> so 
So here, it's you know, sort of an essay. He's sort of saying, what does this scene do for me? And he's sort of um, giving a few examples of what this scene does for him, what he owes them, right? What he owes them. And the first thing is when he's in town, when he's in cities, um, you know, uh, mid the mid the din of towns and cities, you know, the, the noise of towns and cities, I've owed to them an hours of weirdness, sensation sweet. When I'm depressed and tired, uh, what I, I have owed this scene sensation sweet, which means good feeling, which means powerful um, uh, pleasure, pleasurable feelings. Um, and I felt it in my heart and even in my mind and pat, you know, it sort of replenishes me. He says tranquil restoration. It gives him peace and it restores him. Tranquil restoration. It's like how some people say, I need to, I work so hard. I need to kind of spend a couple of days on the beach, um, to, to replenish myself, to restore myself. I need that calm to kind of restore myself. So he says this place, this scene, this memory has come in handy when I have been in cities and it has given me sensations sweet and it has also allowed me to be restored tranquilly. Dash, feelings too of unremembered pleasure such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on the best portion of a good man's life. Feelings, this word feelings, um, this place has made him feel um, a kind of pleasure. Um, and this pleasure has, he says, it has no slight or trivial influence, which means these feelings have a really powerful influence. It's not slight or trivial, it's a, it's, it's a profound kind of influence on the best portion of a good man's life. His little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love. So that's the second thing, right? It, it has given him a feeling um, that has influenced his ability to love his fellow man. Um, his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love. And when you do something nice for someone, when you act kindly to someone, uh, you know, it's not remembered by, by them, but it's, he finds that the reason he was able to do these things and to be kind to his fellow man, to love his fellow man, really has a lot to do with the feelings that he gets from being here at Tintern Abbey. And third reason is, nor less, which means not less, right? Um, or last but not least, you know, but he doesn't use such a cliche like that. Nonetheless, I trust to them I have owed another gift. I trust means I believe that I've owed them another gift. Again, the gifts of sensation, sweet, tranquil restoration, uh, of unremembered acts of kindness and of love. And finally, gift number three, of aspect more sublime. The word sublime, what does the word sublime mean? Um, look it up. But um, sublime means something that is so incredibly um, pleasurable that it kind of elevates you to another realm, a transcendence, if you will, right? of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. Incredible line here. Right? They have given me an aspect more sublime. They have made me look at life in a more sublime way, and sort of see the magic in in the world um, and it's given me a blessed mood a blessed mood right it's 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 altered his mood and gives him this 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 blessed mood um, 
a blessed mood. Now this is the kind of religious language. And the mood in which the burden of the mystery and the heavy and weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. God, it's incredible poetry here, right? Um, it's given me a way to feel and the things that I don't understand in this world, right? The burden of the mystery, bur it just bur burden just means burden of the mystery in the heavy and weary weight of all this unintelligible world. All those things that I don't know, all these things that happened to me, you know, COVID-19, you know, uh, whatever. Um, just this, this crazy, unintelligible world, this mystery, you know, um, that feeling of being uncertain and in doubt, feeling insecure, whatever you know it's um these mysteries that we we have in our lives you know what am i meant to do um what's what does my future hold um will i ever find <clears throat> someone to love me what will happen to my children um you know what's gonna what's gonna happen with this this uh covid19 you know just you know the election Every, any kind of thing that presses on you and that you don't understand or you can't understand or is not understandable, it's unintelligible. The heavy and the weary weight of this unintelligible world is lightened. So that burden, that mystery, all those things that we are in doubt of, that mystery is lifted off him, is lightened. Not not completely taken off, but is lightened. The burdens that we have and the burden of looking at this world and finding that it's unintelligible. It is lightened by this mood. Where, what is this mood? It's the mood I get when I'm here. It's a mood I get when I am in total seclusion in this place. And this, by the way, is the place you grew up. Right, so he remembers his childhood very fondly. And then he elaborates, you know, this is just like an essay. That serene and blessed mood, serene and blessed mood, in which the affect affections gently lead us on. You know, the mood creates a kind of affection, a kind of feeling. And they lead us into other ways of thinking, other ways of feeling. In which the affection gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. So this mood brings us <clears throat> into a point where we're almost dead, right? The breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, as though time has stopped, right? As though we are no longer a human person. We no longer exist in our corporeal frame right um uh, more our mortal coil as uh, hamlet says and we shuffle off this mortal coil um so he says you know it it is motion of human blood almost as we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul so it's almost like we we get out of our bodies and become a living soul and this, there's a word called transcendence, and transcendence is to be lifted beyond the material, the ordinary world, to be lifted into a different dimension. So this is what, this is what this scene does to him. It gives him a transcendent experience. And while he is this living soul and no longer a body, I made quiet by the power of harmony. The I is made quiet. That's a wonderful 
uh, phrase there, the eye is made quiet. It's sort of like a blind uh, landscape to a blind man's eye. The eye is quiet. It doesn't seek anything. You know, the eye is quiet. It's satisfied with the things that it sees. It doesn't want more. It doesn't seek out more. I am acquired by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy. <clears throat> the power of harmony. This is why you don't want anything more. Because you're in complete harmony with the world. This is what this mood has done to him. It has made him feel harmonious. And harmony makes the eye quiet. I may quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy. We see into the life of things. And if we were in a class, I would ask you, have you ever seen into the life of things? Not seen the life of things, not hung around um, uh, Times Square and see, see people's lives or watch a reality show. It's not seeing the life of things. It's seeing into the life of things. That's the great thing about poetry. You can change, you can use a word into the preposition, right? This simple preposition, into the life of things. What does that mean, into the life of things? It's so abstract. It's so um, sort of philosophical, spiritual. You really don't know. Maybe sees into the life of things, really understands um, the point of life, even, or the mysteries of life. So, again, this is a very powerful experience that he's sort of just recalling and thinking about and meditating. And finally, he says, and this is a very romantic, I, I remember reading this and my uh, professor said, this is the soul of romanticism. This is where... <clears throat> Feeling, intuition, trumps everything, all other concerns. Reality, rationality, logic, scientific proof, anything. Um, if this be but a vain belief, yet, oh, how often darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee? O oh, sylvan we, thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee? Again, yeah, he grasps the power and his connection with this place and how it has done all these things for him. And he said, if this be but a vain belief, I don't care if, if no one believes me or if this doesn't make any sense to anyone or if it's just me kind of feeling this way, uh, me deceiving myself, but it is real because I feel it, right? That is such a romantic notion that feeling is more important than anything else. Right? How often has my spirit turned to the oh, sylvan we, sylvan me, <clears throat> forest. Thou wander through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee? And finally, uh, not finally, but this next um, um, part is very abstract Again, romantic poetry can be like that because the things that they are talking about in romantic poetry really can't be described adequately in words but they can sort of be alluded to if you know what I mean they can be pointed to but you can't really name it um, <clears throat> and now <coughs> excuse me and now with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and, of, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. So as he is um, contemplating the power of this scene and his soul has uh, kind of been lifted away, and he 
acknowledges it, this, this moment, this, this, um, this blessing, his mind starts to forget it. His mind starts to, other things start to infiltrate his mind, right? Because, you know, blessed moods, they don't last for a long time. They're, they're sort of there and then they, they, they are fugitive. They, they flee, right? It's like getting that perfect pitch of feeling, you know, that ideal feeling. It, you know, and it just it just vanishes, and so what do you do after it vanishes? It has to vanish because you can't have that all the time. That's why you have to seek it. So that's what he's talking about here: half extinguished thought. Remember, it's only half extinguished. And many recognitions dim and faint. With some sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. So he's trying to kind of come back to his his mind. The mind is revived and he starts to give a little sort of biography, autobiography. And Wordsworth is a very autobiographical poet, perhaps the most autobiographical poet that I know of. Um, and that's why he was, he's sort of been uh, seen as the most uh, egotistic, e egocentric writer. Um, I, I don't remember who, maybe it was Oscar Wilde who called William Wordsworth, he called his poetry the egotistical sublime. Um, but okay, so Wordsworth continues his poem. The mind is reviving again. That blessed mood is gone, but it's half there, right? Uh, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. There is life and food for future years. Right? Um, that he can use this, this, this experience, this place, this impression, and he could use it and it can sustain him like food. What does he say? Life and food for future years. Right? He can store these things up like the way you store up food in order to continue to live and survive. And so I dare to hope. I like that. You know, I, I sometimes ask my students, he says, I dare to hope. Is I dare to hope and I hope different? Yes, I think significantly different. Daring to hope is 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 really not being very optimistic, you know, but he, he has to be, you know, he has to put his, his, um, his life on the line for this. So I dare to hope, though change, no doubt, from what I was when, I, when first I came among these hills. I'm different now, I'm an adult, and I remember the first time I came among these hills. Sorry. Quit my mail. Okay. Um, no doubt from what I was when I first came among these hills, when like a row I bounded over the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Right? When I was a child, I bounded like a row. A row is like a baby uh, deer. Right? The deep rivers, the lonely streams, wherever nature led. More like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. So back then, it was sort of just instinctual, right? Um, it's not like I purposefully sought nature. It's that, um, you know, I was running around in this kind of instinctively fearful way, right? More like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the coarser pleasure of my boyish days and the glad animal movements all gone by. The pleasures that he got when he was a child, they were coarse. Coarse means like rough and savage, right? And they're glad animal movements. He was like more like an animal. He often describes himself as an animal when he was a child, right? Because like an animal, you, you don't, 
you, you don't you don't think you just sort of react or you um, uh, instinctively react to the environment right it's, it's sort of very ecological nature leads you somewhere um, <clears throat> To me was all in all. To me was all in all. It's great, right? To me was all in all. That was all. That was everything to me. I didn't need anything else. Just me running around these woods. That was all in all. <clears throat> that was everything. Dash. I cannot paint what then I was. Um, I cannot paint what then I was. I cannot really adequately, in language, explain um, what I was when I was a kid, the way I felt. <clears throat> the sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. That word haunt is also a very powerful word for Wordsworth. Um, the catar uh, cataracts are like mountain... Um, they're, they're like waterfalls, right? So the sound of the cataract, the sound of the waterfall haunted me like a passion. Um, yes. Uh, the tall rock. I, I like the word, he's haunted. Um, <clears throat> that's not a good thing, I guess. But... Um, it, it haunts him because it's part of his memory. He can't let it go. Memories, experiences haunt you. Right? you they haunt you by not leaving your mind ever. Um, haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite, a feeling, and a love. Everything I looked upon was an appetite, a feeling, and a love that had no need, need of a remoter charm by thought supplied nor any interest on bar from the eye. So back when I first came among these hills, everything was um, an appetite. Again, things like appetites are, are um, sort of a natural instinct, right? Feelings. Uh, what did I say? A feeling and a love. That had no need of remote or charm by thought supplied or any interest on bar from the eye. I was fully in the moment, right? I didn't need to think of anything else remote that was in here or uh, uh, another scene, right? I'm barred from the eye. That time is past. Dash. I love dashes. That Dashes are uh, the most ambiguous punctuation mark. You don't know what the dash is until you, after you read it. You know, it, it is a kind of break, but what kind of break is it? Is it a, a sudden break that kind of just turns everything or is it somehow connected to what was previous so i said she uh he says that time has passed and all its aching joys are now no more and all its dizzy raptures not for this faint eye nor more nor murmur other gifts have followed for such loss i would believe abundant recompense so that time is over it's gone he's never going to get it back a lot of Wordsworth is about loss. You, you definitely lose your childhood and then you lose the way you interacted with the world and the way you thought about the world and the way you felt in the world. But it's gone. That time has passed. All its aching joys are now no more and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint eye. It's gone, but I don't... I don't, I don't faint, which means I, I don't get down. You know, I'm not destroyed by it. Nor do I mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed for such loss, I would believe, abundant recompense. So I have lost that childhood instinctive passion, but there has been 
I believe, abundant recompense. You lose these things, you know, you lose that kind of childhood intensity, but you gain something else through maturity. What has he gained? You know, when you think about your life, you think about what you've lost, but you also think about what you've gained, right? You have to kind of balance the things that you've lost with the things that you've gained or the things that have compensated, right? Again, when you're, um, you know, uh, you may get older, you may lose a lot of things, right? Like your energy, your, your physical ability, your mental sharpness, but you gain other things, right? You gain a, a kind of a, a calmness, you gain a kind of a bigger perspective, you know? Um, it's not as good, you know, but it is, it is a compensation, right? Like, a, like insurance, right? You know, they'll, 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 they can't replace a one-of-a-kind item, but they can kind of give you some money that could be kind of uh, recompense. Um, but it isn't, you know, it isn't the real thing. But that's what we have. We lose things. Um, <clears throat> For I learned to look on nature not as an hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. So what's the recompense I have felt? The recompense I have felt is, I don't, I don't look at nature as a child, but I oftentimes hear the still sad music of humanity, you know, which is a really hard line to, uh, to interpret. It's a, it's, it's a hard line to um, explain the still sad music of humanity. Now, I really don't quite know uh, how to define what the still sad music of humanity is. But I think it's something like that life is, that, you know, life is sad. Um, that all humans go through this. That living a life is about loss. And it's that recognition, that full understanding of that. That is what has recompensed us or him. I'm not saying us, but, um, you know, this poem has power because you can identify, relate with, to it. Not everything, but maybe some things. Um, that music, it's not harsh, nor is it grating. Though of ample power to chase and subdue. The sad music of humanity doesn't, doesn't crush you. It's not loud or grating. But it's powerful. And it chastens you and subdues you. It calms you down. This is kind of mature acceptance or mature point of view. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and, all, and of all that we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear. So he's lost that animal, but he's gained something else. That's still sad music of humanity and a presence. A presence. And where is this presence? This presence is in the light of setting suns. Okay, not the rising sun, the setting sun, you know, when things go away. Um, it's the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and the mind of man. What incredible poetry. If you had just written uh, those three or four lines, it would make you a great poet for, for just those lines. Emotion that impels all thinking things. Um, this kind of spirit, 
this kind of presence that is everywhere. You know, sort of like religious even, you know, that, that kind of faith in um, a presence. Therefore, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains? And of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive. Okay, I want to sort of stop in here, both what they have created and what perceive. He loves the world, you know, uh, nature. He loves the, the natural world. Both what they have created and what perceive. The eye and the ear perceive something, but the mind has to recreate it, you know, half create and half perceive. We perceive with our eyes and ears, but then our reaction to it creates the impression, right? So it's not just those things are beautiful. It takes, that's just half of it. It takes our mind to fully uh, grasp it and absorb it, uh, or to recognize it, to create right, that impression. I'm well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul, of all my moral being. This presence, right, is the guide, is the anchor. What a great, uh, what a great phrase, the anchor of my purest thoughts. As all my thoughts come from there. They, they're, they're anchored from these beliefs, from this presence the nurse, the guy, the guardian of my heart. He calls it the anchor. He calls it a nurse that, you know, he doesn't mean like a, like a hospital nurse. He means like a, like, like a mother nurse, like, like a mother nursing their child, giving that child sustenance. Uh, the guide, that sounds, you know, even quite religious, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. Wow. I mean, whatever this presence is, it, it is it is the most meaningful thing in Wordsworth's life. It's presence. Keep thinking of that that Led Zeppelin album presence. <clears throat> um Okay. So um then this is the final uh section here. Um and this section is a break from the other ones because this section is sort of dedicated to his sister who is who can be with him right nor perchance if i were not thus taught should i the more suffer my genial spirits to decay for thou art with me upon the banks of this fair river thou my dearest friend my dear, dear friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. The, do uh, the, um, the person, the friend that he's talking about is his younger sister, Dorothy, and he sees the light in her eyes. He sees in her what he used to be. And in a way, that's kind of sad, right? He says, I can't. In thy voice, I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. Again, she's still young and she still has that thing that he has lost. And you could see it in her wild eyes. I've read interpretation, her wild eyes, that she's, uh, she's insane or something. I think someone asked me that. I thought that was really funny. <clears throat> okay, um... Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister. So when I look at you, I behold what I used to be. Um, and this prayer I make, and now he gives a prayer. Right. You know, if, I don't think Wordsworth is a conventional Christian at all. I, I think... I think nature has sort of replaced 
um, God, you know, for him, I think. Uh, and this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Oh, what a great line. Never did betray the heart that loved her. Nature is not like people that betray you. Nature, if you love nature, nature will always give it back. It will never betray you. Um, <clears throat> never, uh, nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Tis her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy. He's talking about Mother Nature. Right? Mother Nature leads you from joy to joy throughout your years. For she can so inform the mind that is within that is within us, so impressed with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessing. You know, use, I hope that you will continue to use nature to help you in living this normal kind of life that is full of bad things, evil tongues, rash judgments, sneers of selfish men, no greetings with kindnesses at, what kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of da daily life. You know, um, nature will guide you through all these things. As long as you have nature, these things shouldn't, you know, uh, affect you and make you depressed. And it gives you a faith that everything is full of blessing. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. And in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, i.e. like himself, like these wild ecstasies, right? Ecstasy in the Greek term means kind of the, an out-of-body experience, right? Um, these wild ecstasies will be matured into a sober pleasure. You're not going to be drunk anymore and ecstatic as you were as a child. You're going to be sober and it's going to give you a sober pleasure, right? When thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms. Yeah, you know, the mind is a mansion for all lovely forms. As though your mind takes all these beautiful things and puts it in its proper place. And it's a mansion, so it could fit all these beautiful things in such beautiful ways. <clears throat> all right. Um, Shall be a mansion for all lovely forms. Thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. Oh, then in solid, if, oh, then if solitude, sorry. If solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me? And these my exhortations. Nor perchance if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together, and that I, so long a worshiper of nature, Hither came, unwearied in that service, rather say with warmer love, oh, with a far deeper zeal of holier love, nor will thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake wonderful again it is a prayer it is it is a hope right um, that when you encounter any any difficulties in life solitude what, what does he say um, uh, oh sorry yes um, right 
uh, if if solitude if solitude uh, or or fear or pain or grief should be the portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy will thou remember me? So you will always associate, and he feels a double a double pleasure. It's just not just nature, that will heal you. With its pr presence, it's also your memory of being here with me. You know, can also do that, and. I want to be a part of the uh, the blessings that nature gives to you, right? And that's and that's how he ends this this really wonderful deep poem that really requires a lot more study. Um, but this is what we have so far. Again, this is not an easy poem. And again, I spent twenty five years trying to read it, and it's some parts are still you know, a, a bit out of my reach. Um, and I don't think that's for a lack of, lack of understanding the language. I think it's for the lack of um, just not grasping Wordsworth's um, way of thinking. I mean, it, it's hard to, uh, to truly grasp it because it's so... Um, it's so out there and it's so complex. In any case, um, let's see. In any case, um, let's see if I have something in my notes. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I'll end this lecture here, and I want you to read uh, the next poem called "Resolution and Independence." It's a fairly easy poem. It's more of a narrative poem as well. Resolution and Independence. Um, and then we're going to talk about the biggie, uh, um, the, the, the major poem of the 19th century, the, one of the greatest poems ever written, the uh, most important, I think, romantic poem ever written. Um, and that is uh, Ode, Intimations of Immortality. And I will post um, a lecture on that. Um, or maybe a couple of lectures on that. So, um, okay, good luck with your paper, and uh, if you need anything, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. All right, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.